Um, so Patrick Heron describes the marriage of indoor and outdoor space through the aperture of the window frame, I quote, as a central theme to paintings between 1945 and 1955. And it's a theme that's captured in Still Life Against the Sea, 1949, in a complex layering of paint. At the time, he was beginning to experiment with paint application and texture in the development of a more personal style. The contrast of very physical elements, such as thick daubs and scored impasto, juxtaposed against dry scumbles and delicate washes, are characteristic of his works from this time. It was within this contextual understanding of the importance of the surface's nuance to preserving the artist's intention that the treatment of the painting was approached at Catherine Ara's studio in London. The painting was a belated gift from the artist to the present owner's mother following the occasion of her wedding in 1948 and had hung untouched in its original frame that you see here, and therefore presented uh, what I've kind of termed as a virgin surface. The work was unglazed, and thus the unvarnished surface had accumulated a significant layer of grey particular surface dirt, comparable to that on the gessoed frame, as well as accretion and drip marks that you can see here. The surface was lean and desaturated, and this is in large part due to the absorbency of the ground layer. So if I compare to a transmitted light, you can see these thinner passages of paint correspond to those that are desaturated, where the ground layer has absorbed the medium of the paint itself. Uh, There's also many pentimenti visible, both due to the textual evidence of underlying brushwork, you can see here, and increased transparency of the upper paint layers, so the forms of uh, previous uh, compositions becoming visible. In reflected light, the paint exhibited a hazy, sparkling appearance, and microscopic examination of the surface revealed transparent crystalline shards across the entire surface, partially embedded in the paint film. The absence of crystals on the exposed commercial preparation of the tacking margin suggests that the source of at least some of the components of this crystalline material originated within the paint film itself. The crystals were readily soluble in water, but unaffected by a range of solvents, and in behaviour and optical appearance, the crystals were akin to magnesium sulphate heptahydrate, also known as epsomite. And these needle-like structures are formed from the conversion of the paint additive magnesium carbonate with environmental sulphur dioxide at elevated relative humidity, and have been previously identified in works using Windsor and Newton paints from this period, which Heron is known to have used. And it's worth noting that um, increased water sensitivity um, has been noted in other works by Heron, and Mary Bustin has recorded um, more sensitivity of paint swatches in the parent Heron paint archive, which consists of paints from a number of manufacturers, primarily Robeson & Co., so it's not just an issue of Windsor and Newton paints. The combination of these factors presented challenges with regard to the removal of dirt from the vulnerable surface. Tess not only found dry cleaning methods to be ineffective, but also quickly ruled out conventionally conventional aqueous cleaning systems, as penetration of moisture from aqueous solutions to the ground layers caused eruptions to occur over the peaks of the canvas weave. Furthermore, the action of swab rolling itself caused abrasion to the surface of the work, and under the microscope you can see here the texture of the paint surface and the divots that were left where the crystals were previously embedded, embedded appeared worn and softened by the mechanical abrasion of the swab which burnished the surface, as was evidenced with an increased gloss in reflected light. It was clear that an aqueous system must be modified to restrict moisture penetration and mechanical action as far as possible. And while gelling agents, which are often employed to decrease diffusion, were largely dismissed on account of the mechanical action necessitated during clearance, a solution was potentially offered by agar gel, which, as everyone's mentioned here, can be applied as a sole, but which forms a rigid gel and thus can be peeled off the surface, which was a system that I'd come across through Anna Greek Volk's research, which was done at the RCE, the Cultural Heritage Agency of the Netherlands, in which the material had performed well for its potential for the use of cleaning of water-sensitive paint. In practice, agar gel cleaning also presented complications. When brushed on warm prior to gelation, removal of the gel caused microscopic flaking of the upper paint layers in areas of desaturation, and it appeared that shrinkage of the gel upon cooling caused a stronger bond between the uh, gel and the pa paint layer itself than between the uh, paint layers, the, with the lean nature of the paint causing poor inter-paint layer adhesion. So to counteract this issue, 
a method of precasting the gel was devised, which we not initially thought we're giving ourselves a pat on the back. We thought that was really novel, but obviously lots of people are doing it in lots of different disciplines. So it just shows how useful these kind of conferences are for widening our and um, broadening our knowledge. Uh, 3% weight volume warm agar gel was brushed out onto silicone release paper in a thin, even layer around 2 millimetres thick in order that a swab stick could be inserted for removal and left to cool. The cold agar gel was then applied to the surface of the painting, gently pressed into contact with the impasted surface, left for a short duration and removed. So uh, you can see this the previous cleaning line. And if you compare it to after 30 seconds... Uh, so some of the, the 30 second application removed the water soluble crystals and some of the dirt but in more soil passages such as here only a small portion of the dirt was removed and after allowing time for residual moisture to fully, fully evaporate following the first application a second was applied for a further 30 seconds which I think you can see makes a visible difference with two 30 second applications appearing more successful than a single application of one minute. Um, and we were kind of hypothesizing that the success of multiple shorter applications may relate to a decline in the agar gel's ability to absorb the dirt as it progressed towards a saturation point. Um, the 3% concentration we used here uh, produced a gel with the ability to conform to the surface texture, unlike higher concentrations, but had a better water retention than, say, a 2%, which released water too readily. Um, and it was, we found that the gel does dry out over time naturally and thus smaller sheets were cast um, in order to maintain consistency. I think, as, uh, was it Kremnazy that said yesterday? Who said yesterday that use, uh, cast it and use it, move on. <laughs> so in practice, a further advantage to the pre-casting the agar was it allowed for tailored shapes to be cut. A Melanex overlay was used to create a template and shapes were cut to align with elements of the composition to avoid the creation of hard cleaning lines. Initially, when examined under ultraviolet light, a fluorescent tide line was visible around the area cleaned, and it became clear that the material was being deposited around the perimeter of the cut shapes, as moisture from the agar spread radially. The poorer water retention at the edges may potentially have been amplified by the fact that we had to gently press the gel into place in order to ensure complete surface contact. However, by overlapping the forms, you can see here the, the two forms, um, this harsh clean line um, neatly disappears um, and no residues were visible in ultraviolet light following treatment. So the success of the agar gel application was indicated by a number of factors. Uh, firstly, on remove the gel, uh, you could see the surface texture of the paint clearly impressed into the agar, showing its ability to conform to and contact the entire surface. On removal of the gel, greyish water was released when pressed, demonstrating that dirt had indeed been successfully absorbed into the gel. And the discoloration of the gel indicated that the majority of the surface dirt was extracted during the first application, with a second removing residual surface dirt, and a third application of freshly cast gel releasing only clear water. So in, in practice, we only did two applications. Um, visual, visual examination confirmed that this dirt is successfully extracted from the paint surface, so you could see the cleaning line that you're following, along with other surface creatures such as drip marks. Uh, visually, the paint appeared lighter and cleaner, with no change in saturation or gloss. No mi microfaking was caused with the application of the gel at room temperature, and no delamination of the paint or ground layers occurred, indicating the moisture penetration was sufficiently minimised. Um, and when compared to the untreated surface, it was clear that without the necessity of mechanical action, the surface texture had not been compromised and crisp, sharp depressions remained as a result of the removal of crystals. So in this painting, where the central theme of Heron's aperture of the window frame functions as a passageway from interior to exterior space, the unvarnished nuanced surface is the metaphorical aperture from the viewer to Heron's artistic vision. The flexibility of an agar gel-based cleaning system with a multitude of variables can be carefully manipulated, uh, provided great scope for the cleaning of such works where fine margins must be balanced to protect the vulnerable surface. In Still Life Against the Sea, 1949, the use of 3% cast agar gel cut into tailored shapes provided precise controls over these factors of moisture penetration and mechanical action enabled an even surface clean without risk to the fragile paint. 
So we do to start. Uh, potential degradation of the complete surface caused by residual cleaning material was avoided because the gel was readily removed by peeling back from the surface with no further clearance necessary. And we could see that in ultraviolet light. One comparison to where we could see where we were leaving residues. Um, beyond this, the case study, uh, the potential of agar gel is broadened by possibilities of physical modification, such as grating, or through addition to the cast gel in order to modify the agar's pH, conductivity, and ability to chelate ions. It thus offers the conservator a malleable tool with which to approach challenging surfaces. And, as always, it wasn't just me, lots of people to thank, but these are just, just a few. Thank you.